uh, welcome yes welcome um so just a short introduction um <clears throat> that's what i've learned about nadi and Sh shirley when i was browsing through the webs um so nadi is working in amsterdam and she actually graduated as an astronomer uh, so she is very technical uh, she has a background in data science and first uh, did some uh, dashboard visualization for a company but just got bored of it so uh, became a freelancer and that's when the creativity uh, spurs i think uh, and newly started with 3d printing as we uh, have seen the these fantastic earrings and uh, and uh, <laughs> pendles um and also uh, i think there was uh, you mentioned somewhere laser cut 3d models uh, so it's a fantastic uh, art and science marriage <laughs> and shirley who is based in uh, san francisco uh, she wanted to be an artist when she was a child and did lots of maths in high school. Uh, um, got bored of that as well, <laughs> switched to business in college, and then discovered software engineering and, and uh, programming. Uh, got hooked on that. Uh, so then she uh, got several jobs uh, uh, as an, in an industry as a developer and visualizer, and that's when she's discovered her true love, the visualization. Uh, she became a freelancer in 2016 and also uh, has a podcast on YouTube with uh, where she talks about visualization. Uh, and she also paints in watercolors. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, and we are very excited to hear uh, uh, more about uh, about you. So you have both learned a lot of science and programming right and also but also you do a lot of arts was the art always sort of on the side or is it uh or was it something um yeah something main in your uh, in your life always mm -hmm. what do you think what uh, or, or i mean what was it was it the main thing or was it the side on the side thing Hmm. Thank you so much for having us, first of all. Um, and then I missed a little bit because my computer randomly crashed and had to restart, um, oh. <laughs> which was weird. But um, to answer your question about art, um, for me personally, I did art. Um, so I drew and I painted uh, from the years of ages of four to 14, always on the side. Like, as I mean, as a student, I was primarily a student and then I was... Um, I was doing the art part for fun. And then I took a few art classes in high school. And then I um, stopped in university. And then um, I kind of just stopped doing art altogether once I got to university and once I graduated um, as a software engineer. Um, and then I think that's what led me to data visualization because I missed it so much. Mm -hmm. um, I missed the creative side so much. Um, and I love coding. I love the logical side of coding, but I think um, I really missed um, like creating beautiful things. Mm. Um, and I think that's what re really like led me to find data visualization and, re and really led me to really fall in love with it um, just because it's such a combination of the three things that I really enjoy, the, the art, um, the math. Um, I really enjoy the geometry aspect of visualization and then also the code. I really love code. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, it's always been on the side. Um, when I was younger, much younger, I dreamt of making it my main thing um, mm -hmm. until I learned how harsh the art world was. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, mm, okay, maybe not. <laughs> But maybe someday, maybe someday still. Yeah. yeah and Nadi, yeah. Uh, I've always had this sort of wanting to be creative side thing, but it was always more of a hobby and never, never really big. So I, you know, I drew lots as a as a kid, but I did stop 
somewhere during my teens uh, and then didn't didn't do do much except that I always had to have at, I had these weird bursts every few months where I got extremely creative in my in my spare time and I would mm. pick up like knitting or I would pick up mm. doing something with pastels or origami or quilling uh, and I would have to have this sort of outlet and then it was I could mm. I could go on again for a few a few months without being very creative but always kind of trying to trying to be inspired um when making my power pack powerpoint decks uh, while working as a data scientist i i was always trying to make it just a, just a little bit more beyond the standard options always trying to look at how to make it slightly different um but it was yeah it wasn't until we started data sketches that i really found this perfect mesh of ah this sort of the hard math side combined with really the creative side and and ever since so ever since i am i have started and really working in this sort of more creative side of data viz i haven't had these sort of ever so ever really monthly bursts of having to do other <laughs> creative things mm. so the 3d printing i guess right now is, is sort of an outlet but uh but i haven't been making weird origami stuff anymore <laughs> for at least a few <laughs> years uh because i know i now can now i can now sort of find a way to do it during my actual work right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's and that's great that you mention it because that's uh, also what uh, I was thinking to ask about. Uh, how does the thing that you do art sort of offline on the side? Mm -hmm. uh, how does it um, impact your visualization, your work online mm -hmm. or I mean in the computer? I think. F um... I think for me, it's it's that I'm I'm more aware of looking at the things that I find beautiful and trying to dissect why I find them beautiful and trying to keep that in my mind somehow. It's like, oh, I like these shapes because this or I like these colors or I like this. And that can be anywhere in the world or things that I find mm. online that sort of inspire me. Um, and then I try and incorporate that back into my visuals when I'm when I've, I've gotten to the point where um, I have my data set, I've prepared it, I've figured out sort of a base design, but then you want to make it, you know, you want to take it to the next step. You want to make it unique or um, yeah. add some sort of stylistic elements, metaphors. And that's when I start thinking about these other things from, from general life and inspiration that I think could actually work in, in these cases. Um, I do use Pinterest boards for that because my memory can only hold so much. So I do try <laughs> and sort of make images and keep images of these things. Uh, but but as I said, uh, being creative outside for me is sort of is is very very low now because I I feel that creative part of me that needs fulfilling is so much fulfilled by my mm. day job. Mm. Um, but it is slightly in different ways where I bought a pen plotter because I I wanted to somehow also take my work away from the the purely digital. I still mm. really love uh, designing in the digital and making things in the digital, but then having the output live outside of the digital. So I've, mm. it's more the other way around is how is my data visualization kind of um, making my creative side different than it was before in a sense with with the pen plotter and the 3D printing uh, kind of coming out of out of data vis. And so it's, I guess it's, it, it, it goes both ways for me right. in that sense. And you, Shirley? Yeah, um, very similar. Um, but, uh, <laughs> I was about to make a joke that was like, I feel like in the last four years, Nadia and I's like interests have really converged. So if you just interview <laughs> one of us, you probably get like both of our answers. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but, um, from, uh, I, I, I'll expand a little bit on the art background of, um, because I think the question about um, how has the art background um, influenced the data visualization, which I think is really interesting. So for me, I think it's um, uh, the art classes I mentioned earlier, I think all of that has kind of um, really helped me from a design perspective. Um, I never took any design classes. I don't have any formal design training, um, but I think what the art classes uh, taught me when I was younger was um, a lot of color theory, a lot mm. of, um, not that I'm good at color. I just know the theory <laughs> and it just like, <laughs> <laughs> I just have that background. Um, and um, I think it also taught me a lot about um, thinking about layout 
in a sense, in the sense of like leading a viewer th- um, through your work and like leading their eyes, like through the shape of, um, of the art or with the layout. Um, and then I think a lot about observation of um, having had to draw and paint many still lives. <laughs> I'm just kind of like, um, I think thinking about um, how colors interplay with color and light and shadow interplay with each other. I think that kind of helps me think through what color combinations might be good. Um, And so in that sense, I think um, that I never really realized how prominent that was, but like in, in reflecting for this book, I realized that a lot of my training in my younger years have carried through. Um, And so I think that's kind of the art influencing the visualization. And then certainly I think because of that background, um, I really also enjoy kind of trying to do non-traditional things visual with visualizations. Um, I mean, some of them um, end up, I think, with good results. Some of them are questionable in the quality of data visualization, but I really love kind of pushing the forms. Um, that's why if you look at the book, um, there's like flowers and crystals because um, I just really, I, I, I really, um, enjoy kind of thinking about the things that I used to paint or that I used to draw and then kind of bringing that into the digital world. Um, so, but yeah, and then, and then, um, nowadays, I think like a year or two ago, I started feeling like I wanted to get away from the computer a little bit, um, in my personal time. So this is why I'm saying, I think Nadia and I basically, <laughs> well, you, you, you started, so I can say that I, we're basically, I we just, by you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, we talk every week. <laughs> so we basically career wise have just aligned. Um, yeah, so I, uh, started really, I think, um, it's been actually, a um, dream of mine starting I think maybe four or five years ago where I I've had this dream of bringing my visualizations out into the physical world I really love the concept of um, being able to be immersed in a work of like instead of just seeing something on our screens that we can like get distracted from and like swiping away you know in like 30 seconds of um, that experience of like especially with it, big immersive installations of like walking into a room and then feeling very captivated by that work and then um, and then all of that kind of distractions melting away I'm very fascinated with that idea And so that's why I started kind of um, maybe two years ago, really starting to explore um, like non, like non-software technologies and trying to bring um, my work into kind of into the physical world. Um, So yeah, like Nadi said, kind of um, it's, it's kind of a, like a cycle of (laughs) non-digital to digital to non-digital again. That's so yeah, fascinating. So, I, I, excuse that's... me. So I, I see, Shirley, you've made your earrings too. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Wait, how did you know? Well, I could see the string behind on the table. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then <laughs> Nadine made her earrings and I thought, oh, you've got to make your earrings too. <laughs> well, yeah, sure those, look. Are, those so, are wonderful. <laughs> thank you so much. I just made these for a friend. I was just working on them yesterday. Oh, so lovely. that's why the... Fantastic. The, that's why the the string is back there um, <laughs> we, the past year with especially with the quarantine has been very interesting because um I think especially in the peak of it last spring and summer um I um realized how burnt out I was with the computer and I it was the first time in my career where I wanted to find a hobby that wasn't um coding before it's always been coding <laughs> um and, and I think that it's been a really, really interesting time of doing um, things uh, that doesn't lead back to my work at all. I think previously all of my hobbies, I would like, you know, code something and then that, that would have some sort of a tie-in with my actual work. I think last year was the first time I tried um, playing with um, resin for jewelry and yeah. I tried playing with uh, my friend gave me an embroidery kit. Uh, I don't think I have the patience for it, but I did try that. <laughs> um, and then um, I've been playing with these knots. And I love this idea of something that like 
is that seemingly has no relation to my day-to-day work but then it's so exciting just working in a new material and being like oh these are the things that I could do that like I could infuse data into it or I could bring it into my day-to-day work um so um there's many things that happened last year good and bad and this is one of the things that I'm very grateful for having had the time to um, because I don't think I don't think I would have otherwise let myself have a hobby that wasn't work related. Um, yeah, that's, and, and, yeah, that's yeah. fascinating. That yeah, you can uh, suddenly try to do something else w- with your hands, right? And then have an inspiration also to yeah. to apply it to uh, to the coding work. Yeah, and definitely. I mean, you're mentioning all these things, and it's. Uh, actually all the stuff connected and also uh, I was about to ask you about that but I don't <laughs> have to anymore but there, w- there was will be a, uh, a meeting um, that we will have uh, with a lady that uh, she is a, a professor st- in statistics in uh, Oslo no well near Oslo I think um, in, in Norway and she also knits and crochets. Knits and crochets. I'm sorry, my my kids <laughs> were want to, just a kiss for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she knits and crochets, and she actually tries to visualize concepts of statistics through the knitting project. Cool. So this is a fantastic thing sort of a little uh, link in the chat there because she's describing uh for example the r number behind the coronavirus you know the infection rate mm. and she knits it <laughs> she knits the concept it is so oh, wow it is so cool okay you talk and i'll find the link and put it in there <laughs> but yeah the the i was just mentioning this because uh i thought this to start oh, the do- discussion about, about this but I mean you are already discussing <laughs> and that's fantastic I mean that's all connected right we think about similar things uh, so that's uh, that's uh, wonderful um, and so my next question would be more uh, of a um, uh, like an advice to somebody uh, so you are both freelancers now, right? You were working mm-hmm. at uh, companies, different companies before. Uh, and the, so the question is, uh, how would you recommend being a freelancer to somebody who is yeah, super creative? And, or, or is it just something that um, you personally chose and, and you think it's very uh, well, it's good for you now, but maybe it's very energy um, uh, demanding or I don't know. What do you think? Is it, it uh, a good way to to uh, create, to, to realize all your projects or your needs? I think for, um, for me, I, I keep saying that it's uh, going to freelance is the best sort of career um, decision I, I've made, but it's not been an obvious step for me. I'm always, I've, I'm very sort of um, risk averse in general. So the idea of not having a steady paycheck was uh, pretty daunting to me and I, I kept it off for, for a long time. Um, but I have to admit that just the, um, the freedom of being able to decide my own course or even my own day, um, the opportunity of being able to work together with people from so many diverse places uh, mm-hmm. and, and, and having been lucky enough that I can make choices. I don't have to say yes to everything that comes in. And I know that's not true for everyone as I'm really happy with that. Um, I think both me and Shirley became freelancers and became got into the data visualization scene at a very opportune time where data visualization was really blossoming and growing and we got a we basically sort of got a foot in there and we were kind of lifted off with that with that stream which is you know part is luck part is uh, just you know us working our asses off uh, <laughs> but, but it was definitely that luck that that got us to the point where we are 
we can both be uh, successful freelancers with uh, uh, people being able to find us and ask us for a project. So um, I can say that, you know, if it's going well, it's it's amazing. And especially if you're creative, uh, because it's so um, you can you have so much more freedom to also work with the clients. There's no boss above you that says this thing, this thing has to go a certain way. You can actually, you know, um, converse together with your client and also because you have a certain portfolio of the things that you generally you like, clients will come to you asking for things that are similar to that. So, which is already something you enjoy. So that again, gets you branching off in creative ways that hopefully you enjoy. Um, however, I've also heard stories from other people that are finding it hard to find clients uh, because they are not so, um, they're not that sort of socially, social media active and have not made their, you know, made their statement and make it, uh, make it easy to find them. Although yet again, I know other people that are have no online presence, but they have such a niche. I know a, a, a friend of mine is in uh, medical data visualization and oh. she has enough work because she gets referred within the community of, of, mm -hmm. of medical people looking for people. And she's always the one that gets referred because she has an enormous backlog of knowledge. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's so many different paths, but I guess I can say, you know, if it's good, it's amazing. <laughs> 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 yeah um i uh so i think nadi covered all of the really good parts that i 100 percent agree with um uh, i guess i'll uh kind of expand a little bit on the um the part that makes it a little bit tough um and i think that's what nadi kind of hinted at which is um it is still a pretty niche industry um and I think that there's two main ways um, to get um, clients. And the first is the route that Nadia and I took, um, which is just to put our work out there um, a lot um, and uh, hope that the potential client finds us that way. Um, and I think um and, and I think that's a, that's a very, because the industry is still so new um, in terms of specifically what we do um, and because like the, um, it's still quite a niche. Um, I found that um, unlike a lot of, let's say like um, broader, like let's say design freelancing or like other industries where freelancing is like well-established, um, I found that um, I don't have much success um, pitching clients because the number one thing about securing a contract um, and signing a contract is making sure that um, the client has a budget. Um, and so um, a lot of, you know, then, then that means that like there's a client pool and then it's the client pool that know what data visualization is. And then the client pool that recognizes that data visualization is very important. And then the client pool that um, has budget set aside for actually data visualization, right? Like a lot of um, companies have budgets set aside for design or set aside for software or for other initiatives, but very few of them have it set aside for data visualization. Um, um, and so I think it's much harder to pitch specific clients on the data visualization projects and much easier to kind of have it be like inbound whenever ha a client has um, a data visualization project in mind to make ourselves much easier to find out there on the internet that way. Or like Nadi said, um, I also know people that like don't have social media presence and then um they but they've like worked at a company for so long that like you know their old co-workers refer them um and so um i think that's the toughest part because that does very much lead to the instability of like if you don't have either of those well established um kind of sources um then it's like any other freelancing gig, the it's it's very unstable um, financially, and that that could be tough. Um, I find it, for example, for myself, um, I find financial planning very hard. <laughs> I find like um, I find saving to be really hard um, because I can only really save at the end of the year after I pay my taxes because yeah. I don't even know how much my taxes are going to be because in America taxes are much more complicated than they need to be. So, 
Um, I'm just putting in, I'm just balancing out all of the good things that Nadi said with all of the, mm-hmm. like the, the things that are a little bit harder, but once, once, um, once we got going, once I got going, it, um, I think it suits my personality so much more. And I think it really is just a personality thing of like, um, I think some people, um, I think the personality I have where I really like being independent. I really like setting my own path. I really like taking my own clients and projects and picking and choosing. Um, I think all of that makes me, lends me to be, to really like freelancing. Right. Okay. Thanks. And, uh, and then uh, how you came to know each other and how you, Uh, collaborated on this uh, project on these projects that then led to a book Uh, it's very it's very interesting I mean you were you are both in different countries and of course you're doing visualization but yeah that's the book I'm waiting for it (laughs) it's so big and heavy so Uh, big yeah yeah, it's someone measured the paperback and it was 2.5 kilograms was it yeah yeah, and the, but then I, I think the hardcover you probably have to add another yeah. some amount to it it's pretty heavy <laughs> yeah nearing three kilograms yes <laughs> um yeah definitely I think we met online originally I think fall of 2015 probably in a slack group for like a very a very small slack group for data viz mm. practitioners um and then that's how we started to like that's how we started having like recognizing each other's names. And then we both um, were invited to speak at OpenVizConf in 2016. And mm-hmm. so um, a bunch of us from that data viz Slack kind of got together in person in Boston to like have lunch before the conference and hang out. And that's where we met each other in person for the first time, yeah. um, which is, <laughs> and um uh one thing to say is that meeting Nadi in person is very memorable um because (laughs) I've told this story so many times Nadi is like oh gosh here she goes again um (laughs) which is that uh, you can't tell online because she's always sitting but Nadi is extremely tall Uh, (laughs) so I remember like having known Nadi for a few months and then meeting her in person I was like hey Nadi (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and then so we hung <laughs> maybe and maybe that's what made me <laughs> just like <laughs> talk to her so much more I don't know um, and, uh, but then we just like hung out a lot during uh, the conference and then um, we started talking again I think once we got back home um, because she had published some tutorials about her open biz talk um or her the tutorials from her talk for the conference and then I was going through them and I started pinging her with questions and then we started talking and then in particular we were talking about how we hadn't um we hadn't um had the opportunity uh to do as many personal projects as we would like because we both were we both had um uh full-time jobs um I had just quit when we were um, starting to talk, but um, you know, for for the year previous, we had both had full time jobs that was demanding enough, or we were doing other things. Um, and then we started talking about like, oh, what if we can have a way to motivate each other? Like, I was like, Nani, do you want to collaborate on something and motivate each other to make a bunch of personal projects? Um, never expecting. <laughs> <laughs> where that would go um never expecting um a four and a half year collaboration um never expecting a book um yeah never expecting this long of a friendship either I don't think when I asked (laughs) like this this, like intense of a friendship I think um I think I thought we were just gonna be casual friends (laughs) yay (laughs) (laughs) Um, okay so oh sorry (laughs) can I ask one question um 
it's kind of related to color and to color palettes. And we don't need to jump into the whole section about color yet, but you're talking about your friendship. You're in two different countries. And when you first started to work together, you know, Shirley's at 36 degrees north, right? You've got in your whole being this, this uh, experience of color because you have more light than the, when you live in the Netherlands. And, you know, the color palette is different, right? Although modern day people from Holland, wear, a lot of people like to wear a lot of bright colors. Mm. Nadi, Nadi's wearing this great red sweater. But um, like when you first started to take your projects or your ideas for a project, your sketches and work together, did you notice that you, the values of your colors were a little different or you had a different interpretation of color? Oh. Is that I'm a far out that. question? No, I it's think- you, some color. I mean, it's so in the- <laughs> <laughs> So we, we set up our project in the sense that we were very, we had a lot of freedom ourselves uh, and we were more each other sort of very direct sounding board. Um, so we would start with the same, we had a topic for the idea was 12 months, 12 topics, 12 projects per person and 24 top, uh, projects in total. And then we both would start from this single sort of word per topic. The first word, for example, was movies. And then we were free to create whatever we wanted, but we would through chatting and, uh, and calling, we would always keep each other up to date and ask each other questions. So in that sense, I definitely uh, saw what Shirley was making, Shirley saw what I was making, but um, we kind of went our own ways in that in that sense and didn't really compare what we did so because also because it could be so different my my first project was about all the words spoken in the lord of the rings movies so i was very inspired by their color palette from the movies mm. to pick colors for that design where Shirley was doing uh film flowers and she had this sort of more of a rainbow palette um to, to create these beautiful flowers so there was there were very often cases where we felt like we could one on one compare things in, in that way. Although throughout the process, we did notice that in general, we like we, we, we gravitate towards the vibrant colors and then reasons for picking colors can change and shift and uh, elaborate throughout making more and more projects. You get more and more thoughtful um, about picking colors through the mm -hmm. sort of experience that you've gathered from other projects. Mm -hmm. um, but I think me being in the Netherlands hasn't, I don't, I, <laughs> people kind of, if uh, I've, I've been told that if people have to define my style, it's like very vibrant and circular. Um, so <laughs> I guess uh, I always, I always go for a rainbow first because it's fun to have, look at rainbow dots on your screen instead of gray dots when you're still developing a project. And of course I'm a scientist, so I have a bias for the rainbow scale, even though I shouldn't have. Um, <laughs> But uh, so so even though I'm Dutch, I uh, I don't think, I don't think that part really affected my colleagues. <laughs> what I, I what I see and what I find beautiful. <laughs> I was gonna say I feel like Nadi, your color palette is like super vibrant, like so much more vibrant, vibrant than mine. I think I think my color palettes actually tend to be more pastel and muted. Mm. And I think I think I've experimented with more vibrant color palettes, but I think like Nadi is consistently vibrant, um, <laughs> <laughs> except for when you do. <laughs> no, 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 I think it's not like Nadi has beautiful color palettes. Um, and actually, when I first started freelancing, I was like, oh, I want to have like my own color palette also. Because like, I think I was inspired by Nadi when I first started freelancing, because um, I noticed how beautiful her colors were. And so I like established my own color palette. Um, and mine was much more pastel. But um, yeah, I would say yours is like very vibrant, unless it's something astronomy related. Um, mm -hmm. In which case, it's like dark, you know, <laughs> like dark, dark background. But dark vibrant. background, it's just that's true, dark colors. background. But like, yeah, but the colors are still vibrant. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay, I think everybody is now very, very keen on uh, looking, taking a peek into the book. <laughs> um, do, can you give us some just um, um, present shortly one of the projects? Uh, maybe one uh, that you. Uh, like the most or I don't know maybe one of one page that you loved the most or maybe one that you dislike the most <laughs> this is this is actually a bigger ask or a harder ask than you imagine because it's really heavy <laughs> and, and it's like really, <laughs> really hard to like open it in like a, <laughs> in I a can, uh, 
Ooh. Ooh. I can maybe talk about oh, this yeah. one. Um, if you can oh, see, this is. Oh. Um, Stars. I probably still can't see it, but this is basically <laughs> a network graph of um, where I use R a lot, actually. Um, uh, where I was in, so the topic was books, and I was intrigued to see if I could find patterns in the titles of popular fantasy novels, because I always feel like they have this certain thing to them, you know, the Swords of Avalon, the blah, 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 that kind of feel to it, death of something. Um, so I, um, I actually used, um, uh, I used, I used the Rvest package in R to scrape the top 100 best-selling fantasy authors from, from Amazon. Uh, that list existed at the time, but I believe it's gone now. Okay. But you, there was a list at the time, and there was five pages of 20 authors a page, and I didn't want to have to do that manually, so I created a really tiny like script in, uh, in R to get all the names. And then I used the Goodreads API, and there's thankfully an R Goodreads package. Of course, mm. there's a package for that that connects to that API, from which I could then request all kinds of information, such as the, um, uh, the, the, the books that the authors had written in terms of their popularity, uh, the rating that they got, the number of ratings, and of course, the titles of the books that they'd written. Um, and through that, I then went through sort of a process of text mining. So to finding, you know, taking out the stop words and the digits and all very specific words such as part, which, you know, part one, part two doesn't, part doesn't really have a, 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 a um, useful thing to say yeah. about the title of a book. So I went through that and then here is a page where, um, so it's, <laughs> that explains it at the start, but it's, a, I of course made a word cloud of the most common words that were, um, that were in the remaining sort of 800 something titles. Uh, and magic was the most common word by far so that the project eventually was called magic is everywhere. Uh, then I ran, <laughs> then I ran a tease me function um, on, on these words, but I also did, uh, did some other stuff in between because the words were so different that to a computer wizard and um, which are as different as wizard and orange, uh, but I know that they're kind of the same. So I tried to use the WordNet package to go to hypernyms so that you basically go one step up in the hierarchy, like a dog and a cat are both animals. Mm. Maybe that's a little bit too high up, but to find that thing, that totally didn't work. Um, uh, so I did it manually. So I made, I made my own sort of categories of hypernyms and I, I grouped everything in these sort of broad categories. Um, and then I did the tease me and, oh, we can see it. I looked at certain words such as uh, animal, mm. where words with animal came across, or fighting, mm. uh, and then uh, made these sort of made that process and, and and looked up where all of the different sort of general areas were, and I sort of color co colored each of them, uh, and then placed these these books in there and made it look a little bit more interesting by having sort of these very uh, flurry lines around it. It kind of spells out the book in a way. If you see a circle is uh, divided in 26 um, places, and then each sort of each angle is a certain word. So then I placed sort of these dots on the on the, the words that uh like you go you you say for the the wizard the wizard the wizard, and then you would basically go from T to H to E, and then the, the W to I to Z um, to make it a little look a little bit more interesting. And that's that's how eventually sort of coming out to to this sort of <gasps> grouping of everything where uh, at the center there's magic because magic was sort of the central theme but around that we go through royalty which is heavily connected to objects and fighting such as swords and, and fighting whereas if you go down you go a little bit more towards um, religion and new and space related themes and on the other side we get fire and blood are very intermixed but blood is very intermixed with water and ice um, and that's sort of the project that came uh, that became the magic is everywhere. <laughs> Ooh, Bravo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very beautiful. I just found it. I just found it on uh, on your web page. So I oh, thanks. The, yes. <laughs> I, put the, I mean, the final visualization. I put the link on the in the chat if somebody wants to see it online. <laughs> Uh, and Shirley, did you have oh, uh, one? I, th I, th I thought Nadi was going to, I thought you were going to sh share this one until I realized it was uh, you were sharing that one for the R packages. Um, but I really, this is my favorite Nadi chapter um, in, <laughs> in terms of like, I think it's like one of my favorite projects from you. And I guess it's really hard to, to see. I'm like balancing it on my neck. Um, but uh, the... 
um, in progress Just screenshots um, and all of the different iterations that you went through, I thought was like really be beautiful. I don't think I've told you this, that this is my favorite chapter from you. No, um, yeah, it's the first time I hear this. <laughs> yeah, but uh, so I guess I'll just <clears throat> flip through this right now. Um, but I guess for, for me, um, I actually, um, I actually enjoy just from um, not not anything to do with the project, um, the end project, but from a, um, I had the most fun working on that chapter is this one um, mm -hmm. uh, from our nature topic, and it's called Send Me Love. Um, and the um, the data set is uh, 3 million texts that SF MoMA, um, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, received um, in 2017 because they had this pro program um, where people could um, send SF MoMA texts that says something like, you know, send me San Francisco, send me love, send me happiness, whatever. Oh, um, and then SF MoMA would match that keyword with a um, artwork in their collection and then text it back. So in the, I think the span of a few months, they had gathered three or 5 million texts and then they had asked me to visualize it. Um, and so this is kind of the, I guess the end visualization. Um, and it's like a tree, each tree represents um, a set of texts that a person set. Um, but I really, I really, I think more than the end visualization, this is one of those projects where I enjoyed the process the most. Um, and so when I started, I was like, oh, I really want to be cheesy and I want to make art out of their data set about art. <laughs> <laughs> and so I started looking into, um, I've always had a dream of um, making, coding watercolor effect. Um, and so this is where I start. Um, I try to like programmatically create watercolor effects. Um, and then this is kind of amazing where, yeah. um, and then it like did not look good once I put the, plug the data in, <laughs> like oh, the top so part often. is, <laughs> yeah, that's what happens all the time. The top part is um, the, I can't even point to it, but yeah. that one is, you know, um, not with, with no data and looks really good. And then once the data is plugged in, I was trying to color by um, the primary colors of the artwork um, did not end up looking very well. So then I start kind of, um, I don't know why, I just keep going back to flowers. So I started um, playing around with programmatically generating um, flower shapes and in this one I had a lot of fun because I was trying to like make it look sketchy yeah have like a sketchy effect yeah and so I don't know if you can have if you can see the strokes but um kind of figured out oh we can't uh, we can't uh, hear you now oh um <laughs> yeah <laughs> no worries um but figured out how to programmatically like vary the line width and stuff mm. um and then started plugging the data in with um, the flowers also. Um, and then start, started experimenting with the layout of the flowers. Um, and oh, and then I was in Tokyo at the time and the cherry blossoms were oh, blooming. Yeah. And that's actually the um, inspiration for um, the layout of um, of the data because then I kind of put them onto branches um, because uh, without that, it was looking really cluttered and busy. Um, and then, and then this was, this was one of the ideas, but that ended up um, looking very cluttered and busy also. Um, the circle in the middle is supposed to be the um, artwork, but uh, hmm. taken out for copyright reasons. <laughs> Um, and then a few more, um, a few more different attempts at layout, and then the final, the final visualization looks like this. So this is one of those projects where um, I don't think the final visualization looks. Um, I don't. I, I don't. I, I don't think it's my favorite in terms of the final visualization, but I had a lot of fun. 
um, with all of the kind of like the in-between stages. And actually, sometimes I feel like all of the in-between actually look prettier than the final. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have any part of the um, uh, process of creating a visualization that you don't like, that you think maybe it's boring or, or yeah, you don't like it somehow? Uh, difficult question. <laughs> well, well, I feel like I, I know Nadi's. Wait, wait, can I get, can I guess Nadi's answer? <laughs> Is it mobile? <laughs> it has to do with mobile. A lot. To, yes, it, it it encompasses mobile. Yes, it's the uh, the part where it, it it's no longer really about the creative design, but about constraints that are not and forcing me to be more creative. So it's doing, uh, coding the interactivity in such a way that everything works and no matter what you do, it always works. No matter if somebody clicked there first and then did something there and did something there and then it still works. And even if they go back, it still works. So I hope, I hate that kind of sort of having to code just for the technology part. Uh, so that includes interactivity, includes browser bugs, because it's so annoying that yeah. when you have an idea and it works in Chrome and suddenly you need to rewrite it because Safari doesn't have a way to handle it. Uh, and then the <laughs> third is uh, performance, also really still to technology. It's like you have a great idea with stuff moving around and but then you see you program it and you see it on your screen and it's just, you know, it's not, it's, it's not working and you have to sort of um, bring it down, bring your idea down to a way that the browser can handle it. So it all, it's all has to do with uh, technology. And, um, <laughs> so I love the whole design process, thinking about the design and making, finding my style, but the technology, that's why I like creating static charts. It's nothing <laughs> of that sort. So now I have to ask Nadi to answer for Shirley. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is. It could be the same, but I, I actually don't quite know how much Shirley enjoys digging through the data itself. That's wow! <laughs> like I know you can do it. That's not it. But I don't know. I actually don't no, know. No, no, no. The, how the wow it. is the wow is like wow. We've obviously talked too often. Uh, <laughs> because I was just about to say. I think there are uh, edge cases about. Um, coding that annoy me um uh but I guess being trained in software I think that like I I guess I have a certain you're just way better than it that's just to say no, well, the, say no I, I I think I just have a threshold of tolerance for it in that in the sense that I don't enjoy it but like I kind of accept it as part of my job because I've had to do that for years um I don't like mobile <laughs> I just I don't like um but um, yeah, you're right. Um, I think I'm weakest on the data side. And certainly there are times I, where I really enjoy the data collection. Um, but um, I think sometimes I find it like, I, I think unless it's a data set I'm really excited about collecting, um, especially manual entry, I find it a slog. Um, and I think that I oftentimes struggle with the data side, like the data analysis side. Um, and I, I run out of ideas of what to try, um, sometimes really quickly. And I think that's, that's, um, I'm not sure if I dislike it as much as I know I'm weak at it and I'm trying to get better at it, but I'm not that good at it yet. Um, so yeah, the wow was like, wow, you guessed that correctly. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we were, uh, I guess we're um, closing in this hour now, but uh, if you are able to stay like 10 minutes longer, we can answer the questions from the audience if there will be any. But uh, last question for me um, is, uh, do you have a new project going on together? Do, do you have plans for the future together? No, I think after four and a half years of having to <laughs> have to work together <laughs> so much. Damn, it's damn harsh. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> I, already 
that's not it. I think it's more it's healthy for us to, to, to find our separate ways Be, before we. I don't. Really I don't think you're making it sound any better, not even. I love Shirley. Just know that. But, <laughs> but we. <laughs> We both, this book is uh, writing a book is just freaking yeah. much work, and we kind of, um, it you know, it's you're, you're looking forward to that point of where the book is actually there and you've put in all the effort, and that point is finally here, and now we kind of need <laughs> to enjoy that for a little while, yeah, yeah. I think Nadi's absolutely right. I think for the health of our friendship, <laughs> I think uh, a break from working together, um, is good. I think, I think that, um, I think working with friends is always like a little bit tough. And I think, I think it needs a balance of like um, tough in the sense that like, you know, if you don't get like, if you don't agree on something, like it's not just a working relationship that's at stake. It's a friendship that's also at stake. Um, Thankfully, I think we like had been able to establish enough respect and trust for each other over the years that like, even when we did clash an opinion on this book, um, we were able to resolve them okay. But I think the number of times that that happened means that I think it'd be better for our friendship if we (laughs) took a few years off (laughs) and then then maybe can come back to work together. So I agree 100% with what Nadi said. I just like, <laughs> I just was like giving her a hard time. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. It's been uh, wonderful to hear you, the story and to see the visualizations. Um, and there was, there are probably lots of questions. Yeah, Alice if, uh, is writing, raising her hand. Uh, yes, uh, I just noted that. Um, I was thinking that many of us in our ladies, so we are researchers or working research and we use a lot of time um, gathering data, analyzing data, cleaning data, uh, working with the data. And when it finally comes to communicating our results um, to the scientific community or um, the public in general, um, I I think, uh, at least speaking for myself, I think a lot of us may feel that we fall short in that aspect. So when it comes to the last hurdle, um, yeah, we don't make as beautiful visual- visualizations as you do. So I was wondering if you had some specific or concrete steps that you could um, advise us to uh, look at to sort of refine or improve um, yeah, our output. Yes. Um, actually, uh, I give... I, I used to give conference talks uh, and a lot of my uh, my talks are in that thread where I want to help people go beyond the default because it's been so important for me as well, starting out as a researcher and a data scientist. Um, so I don't want to plug myself in that sense, but uh, I have one called Hacking the Visual Norm, which is all about that, uh, which maybe you can uh, watch, but in, in general, it comes down to sitting down and taking the time to actually think about what chart you're going to make instead of immediately going for the available chart button in a way it's it's about think about the data that you have and the goal that you have what what is the insight that you're trying to convey what question should people be able to answer if they see your visualization and if you if you understand that um you you know what data you need from your data set like which variables would be needed to answer that and which variables might be nice to have to give context around the whole and with that and this is sort of the tricky part and comes with experience but with that you kind of need to uh, go through some of the charts that you uh, or think about how could you display that to make that clear and this is this is the hard part because you know the more experience you have at making visuals the better the easier it gets to make that connection. Well, if this is my question, this is my data, this would be a good way to show it. Uh, But that's why I would recommend maybe looking at data visualization catalogs. So I think there's a datavizcatalog.com, which shows you a whole collection of different chart types. And these are from the standard to the quite exotic um, and try and see how your data might fit into them. Like how would your data look in a Sankey diagram? Would that work? Uh, that works with flows, but how would it look as a hierarchical diagram or as a as a cluster diagram and try and sort of um, feel like how if that would work? And if it does, maybe try and draw it or create it. Um, and then the, the last step is sort of the design is that generally people do like looking at things that look nice, their eyes are drawn to it more. 
So that's why you also want to make that last step to make it look good and make it look professional and actually, you know, again, taking the time to make it look good. And to do that, what I usually do is try and see something, look at something that you think is, is beautiful. And again, try and dissect what you, why you like it. Is it the color palette? Maybe try and apply that color palette to your visuals well, or something or the font type. It can be small things such as making, you know, ma not making your grid lines very apparent, but muted grades. These, it, it starts at those basic steps and can go on until you're, you're happy with it. But apart from these sort of general uh, rules, it's also the experience also takes time, uh, comes into play plus plus again just taking the time and not assuming that it's um, easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I guess um, I guess I'll plug our book in that case um, because yeah, it's only fitting. Do... Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, what? Uh, that, that's only appropriate that you would do yeah. <laughs> because we do have um throughout our chapters our chapters are all process write-ups that have you know um talks about the thought process of it's certainly not you know um condensed into a 45 minute talk but um but it it does expand a lot on our thought process behind each design decisions um and then and then we we've also organized them into lessons by like data design or data sketch and code um and so there these lessons are kind of like spread throughout the books so um i guess if if nadi is gonna plug her talk i'll plug our book <laughs> um but yeah i agree a lot with um i think oftentimes um I, I totally understand that the visualization part can be an afterthought because you've done so much work with the data side already but definitely if you have the um opportunity to um, give yourself a little bit more time for the um, visualization side. I think that would probably, on top of basically everything what Nadi said, um, but I think just giving yourself the time to explore um, towards the end and not not have it as an afterthought. Um, I think that would probably be like a great starting step. Yeah, I guess I was thinking it's sort of such a shame that you used so much time and a lot of work and then uh it's important to communicate your results out mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. yeah and then that process sort of gets uh yeah maybe you get a day or two to fine-tune your figure and you should be able to use more time than that I think yeah definitely yeah uh, do you have like a default um step or two that you always do if you say you have like a Cartesian plot or a graph of some sort are there some steps that you would always do like uh, get rid of the good lines or something like that oh interesting um from a design perspective do you mean or yeah. I don't think there's any like consistent thing I do um I do have like a few guidelines for myself from like a the data side only because again I don't have a data background I have a software engineering background so um I don't think anything I say would be helpful because they're just rules that I made up for myself um, that you probably have much better ways of doing it. I, um, but from a design perspective, I, I think I have rules for myself when picking colors um, in the sense that I um, I will try, I have my own color palette. And then when I'm picking, especially with categorical colors, um, uh, I'll pick somewhere between four to seven of them. And I'll always run it by this tool called a Viz palette um, by Suzy Liu. Mm -hmm. um, and that helps me because that, that one, um, if you give it an array of hex codes, it will say um, if there's any, it, it will help with accessibility. So it will um, say uh, if there's enough contrast between the colors and if there's um, enough distinction between the color names. Um, and then it will, you can toggle between all of the different types of color blindness to see if your colors are safe for all of them. So I think that's the only design rule I have for myself. I don't think I have any others. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Because a lot of like Gigi plots um, and colorblind palettes, some mm. of them are ugly. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> <They're> great. <tips. laughs> 
It's my subjective opinion, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I think color. I think picking a color palette for a uh, project is really fun. I'm um, like picking a custom color palette. Yeah. Anyone else who has a question for August? I mean, I have lots of questions, but <laughs> not going to make it longer than needed. Um, I, I also, I, I only have three more minutes anyway. Oh, oh, okay. So, okay. <laughs> so oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, just to wrap up. Um, thank you very, very much for uh, agreeing and for showing us and for giving the tips, fantastic tips, uh, um, how to yeah, improve our visualization skills and we wish you luck in all the projects, uh, offline and online. <laughs> and <apart. Thanks>. independently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you. So for having thank us. You. It was a pleasure. Great. Okay, we'll see right. you.